Welcome aboard for this edition of Grace Community Church Online. Would you join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious time. We ask, Lord, that you would minister to our spirits and hearts, Lord. Fill us with your grace, Lord. Let us know and do your will. Help us to become better acquainted with you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Announcements. Uh, this coming week uh, is set up for Country Store, which will be followed on the 15th and 16th by the store itself, opening early in the morning on Friday all day, and then Saturday until 2 in the afternoon. And then we'll need your help to help come and clean up. So that's the primary announcement. Uh, Country Store is the time in October when the tail wags the dog. Country, everything kind of grinds to a standstill a bit because we have a lot of work to do to get everything set up. And we're so thankful for our co-chairs, uh, Pandora Alstrom and Dean Langmaid, who have been working hard all year long. And many of volunteers, many helpers are helping us. And so that's coming up soon. And that's our primary announcement for now. Please join me in singing, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you are, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord.
Let's talk about a couple of prayer requests. Uh, I have one. My oldest son, Greg Graham, needs your prayers. He's going through a tough time. I won't say too much more than that. Um, uh, Tony uh, Sewell, uh, they lost their youngest son. He expired of perhaps a heart attack. This past Saturday was the funeral. Would you pray for Bonnie and Tony Sewell? They have been attending the church and uh, they need our prayers. Also like to pray for the brother of Linda Haley. His name is Michael. He was taken to the hospital with heart issues. It appears he may have a collapsed or bent aorta and may have to have surgery. He's in the hospital as I speak right now at this present time for uh, Mike. And I don't know his last name. I know Linda Haley's brother is who it is. And that's her married name, so I don't know what her brother's last name is. Those are my prayer requests. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you, Lord, that you hear and answer prayer. I pray for my son, Lord. Going through a difficult time, Father, complete the work you've begun in him. He is a wonderful soul, a wonderful person, Lord. I ask that you would strengthen him, bless his sister who is with him now, trying to encourage him and build him up, Lord, and help him get the the help he needs, Lord, to move forward in his life. Thank and praise you, Lord. Uh, we pray for the Sewell family, for Bonnie especially, as she's grieving the loss of her youngest boy, Lord. This is not an easy time. I ask, Lord, that you would be with that family and help both Tony and, and Bonnie. In Jesus' name, I pray. And for Michael, Lord, Linda Haley's brother, Lord, would you strengthen him? Let the doctors have the wisdom they need in order to solve his medical problems. And now we pray the prayer that you taught your first disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Would you join me in our reading? We are beginning today a number of messages from the book of Deuteronomy, the intention being that you might get acquainted, get better acquainted with the God of heaven and earth, the one whom Jesus introduced us to by giving us his prayer, our Father who art in heaven. So listen to this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 4. 
Now search all of history from the time God created people on the earth until now and search from the ends of the heavens to the other. Has anything as great as this ever been seen or heard before? Has any nation ever heard the voice of God speaking from fire as you did and survived? Has any other God dared to take a nation for himself out of another nation by means of trials, miraculous signs, wonders, a war, strong hand, a powerful arm, and terrifying acts? Yet that is what the Lord your God did for you in Egypt right before your eyes. He showed you these things so that you would know that the Lord is God and there is no other. He let you hear his voice from heaven so he could instruct you. He let you see his great fire here on earth so he could speak to you from it. Because he loved your ancestors, he chose to bless their descendants, and he personally brought you out of Egypt with a great display of power. He drove out nations far greater than you, so he could bring you in and give you their land as your special possession as it is to this very day. So remember this and keep it firmly in your mind. The Lord is God in both heaven and earth, and there is no other. If you obey all the decrees and commands I'm giving you today, all will be well with you and your children. I am giving you these instructions so you will enjoy a long life in the land your God is giving you for all time. Isn't that wonderful? Our New Testament reading is from the last book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to start with verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshippers, and all who love to live a lie. And now hear the words of Jesus himself. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. And if anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city that are described in the book. He who is faithful, witness to all these things, says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord be with all of God's holy people. That ends the words of Holy Scripture. Those are the last words in the Bible. The end of the book of Revelation. Holy Father, Jesus, Savior, blessing Spirit, hear I pray. I am but a wandering pilgrim, grateful I may pass this way. Mists rise over the mountain ridge, though I am bound to time and place. Still I hear your graceful calling.
to impart to each one your graceful calling. Come, beloved, know my heart. Come, beloved, Now, I would ask you to join me, and if you have a Bible, if you would open up to Deuteronomy chapter 4, we are going to begin a journey of discovery. What are we going to discover? The title of the message today is Knowing God. You see, the first four words in the Bible, in Genesis, say, In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. It goes on to say, created the heavens and the earth. But I want to focus on the four words. In the beginning, God. Who is this God? What is he like? We're going to begin a series of messages from the book of Deuteronomy to try to discover clues from Holy Scripture, clues about God's character, his personality, his temperament, he is named with the Tetragrammaton YWHW. It's unpronounceable in our language and no vowels are given in Hebrew. Yahweh, Yahweh. And we'll refer to him as Yahweh for lack of any better designation of the four letters. In your Bible translations, whenever you see the word Lord capitalized, L-O-R-D capitalized, what is actually there is Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton the Y-H-W-H, but we just put it the Lord. His name is unpronounceable. So the book of Deuteronomy, which we're going to be taking our sermons from, records the covenant between God and Israel. It calls each new generation of Israel to remember who God is and what he has done for them. In three separate speeches, in this fifth and final book of the books of Moses, we call them the Pentateuch, otherwise known as the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and now this fifth book, Deuteronomy. He summarizes the events that have led to the eve of their entry into the promised land of Canaan. Moses, in this book of Deuteronomy, exhorts the Israelites to remain faithful and obedient and calls them to rededicate their lives to the task God gave them. What is that task? To occupy and enjoy the bounty of the land that he is giving them as a gift. We call it the land of promise, the land flowing with milk and honey, the promised land. And then he leads them in worship in this book. Finally, toward the end of the book, he appoints Joshua as his successor and then goes by a high mountain by himself to view the promised land from a distance before he died. Well, why wasn't he allowed after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness of after leading them with a strong hand with God's help out of Egypt why wasn't he not allowed to enter the promised land well that's because he was prohibited by the Lord the story is told in Numbers chapter 20 verses 1 through 13 and I want to read that story to you right now all right In the first month of the year, the whole community of Israel had arrived in the wilderness of Zin and camped at Kadesh. While they were there, Miriam died and was buried. But there was no water for the people to drink at that place, and they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. 
the people blamed Moses and said, If we had died in the Lord's presence with our brothers, why have you brought the congregation of the Lord's people into this wilderness to die along with all of our livestock? Why did you make us leave Egypt and bring us here to this terrible place? This land has no grain, no figs, no grapes, no pomegranates, and no water to drink. Whining, complaining. Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle, where they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them, and the Lord said to Moses, You and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water from the rock to satisfy all of these people and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to come and gather at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. Must we bring you water from the rock? Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with his staff and water gushed out. So the whole community and their flocks were filled and drank their fill. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I'm giving them. This place was known as the waters of Meribah, which means arguing, because there the people of Israel argued with the Lord. And there he demonstrated his holiness, which is another way of saying he demonstrated his power, his glory before them. So that's why Moses was prohibited from entering. And let me explain. It's because of the symbolism of the rock. The rock, most scholars believe, was a symbol of Jesus, Jesus Christ, the coming Mashiach, the Messiah of Israel. Back in Exodus 17, Moses had been commanded to strike the rock with his staff just once, and water came forth, and it satisfied the thirst and sustained their life. And that reminds me of a passage in John chapter 7, where Jesus, after a great feast, stands and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. You see, water from the rock symbolizes the satisfaction and the life-sustaining presence of God in a person's life. And the rock, the Lord Yahweh, meant to be a representative or a, a construct of the future Messiah. So in Moses, in chapter 20 of Deuteronomy, when again Moses is to now not strike the rock with his staff, but merely speak to it. The rock is a type of Christ. The rock had already been struck earlier in the journey with his staff, symbolizing the crucifixion that Jesus was struck down in the prime of life. And in Exodus 17, water came out after he struck the staff as ordered with his staff. But Moses' staff speaks of the crucifixion, one time for all time, the savior of the world gives his life for the sins of the world. So when Moses in anger, and because of the complaints and griping and continual whining of the Israelites, one time they were so upset they were about ready to stone him. Uh, he just was exasperated. And as I read earlier, he was disobeying the clear instruction from the Lord. And in ignorance, he was symbolically and tragically re-crucifying the archetype, the rock, as Jesus Christ, the anointed Messiah who bore the sins of the world. This, even though he did not fully understand or grasp it, by being disobedient to the clear commands of the Lord, he committed a grievous error. And because of this disobedience, even though he was not aware of the significance of the spiritual damage he was demonstrating, because what we do here in the physical plane, in the space-time continuum that we are locked into, does have consequences 
for the spiritual world that we are headed toward. And that's something you need to learn and listen to very carefully. We are not operating in a vacuum. As Shakespeare once said, the whole world is a stage and we are but actors on it. Well, that's limited. In a sense, though, we are in a gymnasium, a preparation place, the world that we live in, and the decisions and choices and behaviors we act out of our devotion to God and our love for God are being recorded for all time. And that's why the books will be opened and all of us will be held accountable for what we do while we're here. And that's a very serious thing to think about. His punishment was banishment from literally setting foot in the promised land, which was the whole goal from day one of leaving Egypt. And Moses had been designated to lead the people into the promised land, but because of this disobedience. And you might say, well, that doesn't seem fair. Well, maybe from your perspective or from mine, it doesn't seem fair. But from God's perspective, that's why we're doing this study in Deuteronomy, that we might learn more about the character and nature of this God whom we say we serve and say we love, but we have basically a childish imagination of who or what he is. We have not done careful study in the scriptures over the years of our Christian journey to become better acquainted with the God of heaven and earth, the God of the Israelites, who is also the God of the Gentiles who were brought in to become part of the one people of God through our faith in Christ's Messiahship, in his laying his life down as the son of the living God, as God the Son, God committing deicide for the sins of the world in order to, by grace and through mercy, give us an opportunity through our faith to have deep trust in the living God, to become part of his chosen people who will live in the world to come forever and ever. What is the takeaway from this passage? The importance of obedience to the clear commands of God. Moses allowed his frustration with the continual whining of the people to bubble up into his righteous indignation, which is a kind word for his anger and bitterness, and in a fit of uncontrolled anger, he struck the rock, not just once as in Exodus 17, but twice, thereby incurring the judgment of Yahweh which was basically a pretty kind judgment when you think of the significance of what we're talking about here. He just said, Moses, you could have experienced the joy of basking and walking finally into the land that you've struggled for 40 years to lead these people to. But because you disobeyed me, because you didn't listen and fear me, you were not careful to be obedient to what I specifically told you to do. I ask you to speak to the rock. But because of your rage and your anger, you struck it, not just once, but twice. Not good. The lesson for us, never react in anger to anything. Just don't react in anger. Count to ten when you're upset or frustrated. Otherwise, we may sin against another person or even God himself in our rage, in our anger, in our righteous indignation, because we're right. Listen to what Moses shared with God's people in chapter 4 of Deuteronomy. And I think I've already read chapter 4, 1 through 13, but I'm going to read it again as a reminder for you. Now, Israel, listen carefully to the regulations that I'm about to teach you. What he's saying is, listen carefully that I'm going to give you some laws. He starts with the Ten Commandments, and we'll look at that in our next lesson in Deuteronomy next week. But in verse 7, he says, He is a God who hears and answers prayer. Let me read it to you exactly as it says. For what great nation has a God as near to them as the Lord our God is near to us whenever we call upon him? Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? A God who is willing to hear us when we pray and to answer us when we pray. And in verse 10p, he says, in 10, listen carefully to what we read here. 
Never forget the day when you stood before the Lord your God at Mount Sinai, where he told me, Summon the people before me, and I will personally instruct them. Then they will learn to fear me as long as they live, and they will teach their children to fear me also. You see, it is important to have a healthy fear of God. It is he who will judge us at the end of our lifetimes. It is he who determines whether or not we have practiced what we preach, whether we have grown in our faith, whether we know him personally or not. And this is critical for us today. Let's close with prayer. Father, I thank you for this message, this lesson, Lord. Help us to begin to look for the clues that give us insight as to your personality, as to how you think and how you behave, how you interacted with the chosen people, the Israelites, Lord, as they entered the promised land. We have now entered that promised land through our faith in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, help us to become better acquainted with who you are, that we might hear your voice and walk in your ways and emulate your righteous deeds in the earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shine like the sun and hold you in.